Hi, everyone, and welcome to the last recorded lecture for Anatomy and Physiology 1 on sense organs. So this is chapter 16, uh, and we'll talk about uh, the sensory system and uh, some of the sense organs. So our senses inform us of changes in our internal and external environments. Right? We keep on uh, bringing up the idea of that the brain is enclosed in a skull. It's pretty dark in there. So how does the brain know what's going on? Right? We need to have sensory receptors. We have many different kinds of sensory receptors throughout our body, um, both external and internal. And these are used to detect changes in the environment. And they then send these nerve impulses to the brain, which can then initiate a response. So that's the idea of senses. They're going to inform us of any changes inside our body or outside of our body. So our senses are our way to know what's going on. And senses can be divided into general senses and special senses. So the general senses include pain, touch, temperature, feeling of pressure, um, balance, stretching, and also chemical changes like pH. So the general senses, these receptors are um, scattered throughout our body. For example, we have nociceptors that detect pain throughout our entire body, almost everywhere. The special senses are what you're familiar with when you talk about the sensory system. So taste, which is also known as the gustatory system, smell, or the olfactory system, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Those are the special senses. So these are associated with a specific sense organ. And each sense depends mostly on the sensory receptor. So the sensory receptor is any structure that's specialized to detect a stimulus. So it detects a stimulus, it detects a change, and that it will form a nerve impulse in a sensory neuron. So a sensory neuron is a neuron that carries a nerve impulse to the CNS, right? We spoke about that in chapter 12, that sensory neurons are um, afferents. They carry nerve impulses to the CNS, including the brain. And the brain will then interpret that nerve impulse. And I'll talk about what a sense organ is in a bit, but a sense organ is any structure that combines nervous tissue with another type of tissue that tries to enhance the response to a certain type of stimulus. So a sensory receptor is any structure that could detect a stimulus. And if it has extra types of tissue, then we call that a sense organ, not just a sensory receptor. Remember, an organ is two or more types of tissue that work together to perform the same function. Right, we spoke about that in chapter one. So let's talk about some of the parts of stimulus transduction. Each type of receptor can respond to a specific type of stimulus. And the nerve impulse from the receptor, from the sensory receptor, will then go to the central nervous system by spinal, uh, spinal nerves or cranial nerves. So the sensory receptor is in the periphery. Then those re sensory receptors branch into either cranial nerves or spinal nerves, and then those feed into the central nervous system. And the final destination is always the brain. That's the always final destination. So the first part is uh, where the sensory receptor converts the stimulus energy into nerve signals. So the stimulus can be, let's say, a pattern of light. It can be heat. It could be sound waves. Those are stimuli, right? So it could be a sound or a smell. That's a stimulus. And that can activate a sensory receptor. And that sensory receptor will convert the stimulus energy into nerve signals. That process is called 
transduction. That whole process is called transduction. Transduction just means the conversion of one form of energy into another. So what we're doing in the sensory system is the sensory receptors are transducing the stimulus energy. Let's say it's a sound or a smell, that's a form of energy. And the receptor is converting that energy, it's transducing that energy into nerve signals. And those nerve signals could then inform the brain of what that stimulus is. So the first part is there's a stimulus. So let's say this coffee smell, the smell of coffee. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is it'll interact with our nasal epithelium. So sensory receptors in our nose will then pick up this stimulus. So the aroma, the molecules are the stimulus in this case, the molecules of odorant from the coffee then interact with the receptors in the nose. That is called transduction because you have molecules in the air. That's one form of energy convert into another form of energy. They interact with the nasal epithelium, which generate action potentials. Those are nerve signals, right? So an odorant or a smell molecule is transduced. It's converted into an action potential. And if that message, if that stimulus gets mess, uh, sent to the CNS, the central nervous system, we call that a sensation. So not all sensory signals go to the brain, but when they do, we may experience a sensation. And a sensation is a subjective awareness of a stimulus. So many sensations are filtered out by the brainstem. Um, and a sensation is usually conscious usually a subjective conscious awareness of something. So it's when you actually smell the coffee, that's the sensation. But right now, in fact, if you have a coffee machine, there are many other smells around you. You might not be aware of them. You might not be sensing them, but sure enough, there is the smell of other things in your house. But when the coffee machine is ready, that's the predominant smell. So that's what you're sensing the most. And the sensation created is determined by the brain area receiving the nerve impulses. So with the olfactory sense, it we're not going to have the olfactory epithelium linked to the uh, occipital lobe, for example, right? because the occipital lobe is responsible for visual processing. So the olfactory epithelium has to go through the cranial nerve, the appropriate cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, one, which then has to go to the olfactory cortex and parts of the temporal lobe. So it depends. The sense is rooted to a specific part of the brain, and the brain will then process those nerve signals and interpret it as a sensation. So the sensation created is determined by the brain area receiving the nerve impulse. In the case of a light stimulus, so let's say I'm visualizing this butterfly. And the way that the light is bouncing off of this butterfly is hitting my retina in the back of my eye. So my, there's a pattern of action potentials that are generated when I see this uh, butterfly. And those action potentials, right, were transduced. The light energy that was bounced off of the butterfly hit my retina. And then my cells of the retina are transducing the energy from light into neural signals. And if my occipital lobe gets that information, it'll be sensing it. And then once that um, information gets to the cerebral cortex, then I can perceive it. That's what we call a perception. So the conscious awareness or the perception results from nerve impulses reaching the cerebral cortex. So a sensation is the is an awareness of a stimulus, and we really call it perception once it reaches the cerebral cortex. The book doesn't go um, specifically into the definition of perception. Uh, so we're right now we could use sensation and perception kind of interchangeably. Um, the way that a lot of books explain it is that a sensation 
is something that even if like your gut detects something, that's still a sensation, even though you're not aware of it in the cerebral cortex, that's just perception of it. So it's a little confusing, um, sensation versus perception. Perception is always the conscious awareness of a sensation. So again, stimulus gets converted into action potentials, which are then sensed either consciously or unconsciously. When they're sensed consciously, we call that a perception. So sensory receptors transmit four different kinds of information. Sorry, you can hear my cat in the background. It's being very annoying. So I apologize about that. Um, so sensory receptors transmit four different kinds of information. There's modality, location, intensity, and duration. And you do not have to memorize these as four things. I just want you to understand the concepts. Modality refers to the type of stimulus that a sense receptor receives. So, or sorry, uh, the type of stimulus that a sense produces. So what this means is the modality could be the temperature modality, which means this is a type of receptor that can produce a signal in response to temperature. So it's like, what kind of mode is it? If a sense receptor is in your retina, that means it responds to vision. The modality, right, is vision. So a hearing is another type of sensory modality. So it can be um, either... So that's the modality is all hearing. But then that receptor can either respond to, let's say, high frequency or low frequency in terms of that modality. You can also have a taste modality, and that can be a salty modality or a sweet modality. So it just means it's the type of stimulus that a sensory receptor produces. That's one way that different sense receptors differ. It's the type of stimulus or sensation that receptor can produce. The location is also encoded by which um, nerve fibers issue signals to the brain. So this means which nerve fibers are firing will determine what type of sensory experience you're going to get. So different nerves can fiber, different nerve fibers can only be fired in certain receptive fields. So what that means is the receptive field is the area where a sensory neuron can detect a stimulus. It's like the sensitive area. So a receptive, if a receptive field is very large, that means that a neuron can detect any stimulus within that one large area. But let me um, show you an example of, this is called a two-point discrimination test. So here we have one sensory neuron. This is a myelinated neuron that's reaching the epidermis. Um, so right here, you can see the dermal papillae. So it's just um, in the epidermis. And you can also see that there are two points. And I want you to think about how do you think if you were pricked with two points, and this is one neuron over here, how would you perceive that? What would your brain tell you is happening if two points are hitting this one neuron? So this is one receptive field. And what that means is, regardless of how many points you put in here, your brain is still going to interpret this as just one point. Because this receptive field, it's like a yes or no answer. Is, is there a stimulus? And if, there's a stim if this neuron is stimulated, you're going to feel um, a point there. Your brain is going to identify um, some kind of stimulation in this receptive field. And that's the case of most parts of our body. We have neurons that are pretty spread apart. So we, if like in the back of your shoulder, if you put, you wouldn't be able to discriminate between one or two points very easily because the receptive fields are quite large. If you compare that to like your fingers, so like on the tips of your fingers, are they're very, very sensitive. They're very ticklish because they have a lot of receptive fields there. The areas um, within which a sensory neuron can detect a stimulus is a lot smaller. So if you put, if you were to do this two-point discrimination test, 
you would be easily able to discriminate between two points because each um, point here would be hitting a different neuron in a different receptive field. So it's a lot easier to discriminate between two different stimuli when there are smaller receptive fields compared to when there's a large receptive field. So just for example, in the skin, one sensory neuron can cover an area as large as seven centimeters in diameter. That's almost three inches. So no matter where the skin is touched within that three inch field, it stimulates the same neuron and the brain is unable to tell if it's touched at the farthest end of the three, three inches or the other end. As long as you hit it anywhere within that receptive field, the brain will interpret it as one point. This is a good, this is one of the lab experiments that we have um, as part of lab nine that we're not going to do. Uh, but this is a fun t test to do with a partner or at home with a family member. If you take a paper clip, two paper clips, and you put them very close together, try to see how far apart you can go before you can tell that it's two separate points. So you start off very close together and your brain is going to figure that out as one point. So you see how far apart the two paper clips have to go before your brain can say, oh, those are two separate points. And you'll see, well, I don't want to give away the answer, but you should make a hypothesis. Depending where you put the paper clips on your body, right, you might have different perceptions, right? You might have a different idea of how many um, points you're being pricked with, depending on where your body is. So if you did it in the back of your neck, think about how that would be different compared to if you did it on your fingers, your fingertips. Would you be able to pick up a smaller distance? between the two paper clips on your neck or on your fingertips. So duration is also encoded by the sense receptors. So how long the stimulus lasts is encoded by the firing frequency um, within the passage of time. So basically what this means is how frequently the neurons fire and how long the stimulus lasts will be able to be transmitted by the sensory receptors. So based on, so let me give this as an example. Um, the amount of time we hear a certain sound is encoded by the frequency through which certain neurons in our ear fire. If they stop firing, then we will stop receiving that uh, perception of sound. So that's a kind of obvious one, right? So duration, right? How long a stimulus lasts is encoded by how the firing frequency changes over time. And there's this idea of habituation or adaptation that once a stimulus lasts a very long time, our neurons kind of get tired of firing and they stop. And that's when we get accustomed to something and it fades into the background and I'll talk about this in um, a few slides from here. And finally, the intensity. So the intensity refers to whether a stimulus is very strong or weak. And intensity is encoded in two different ways. So the brain can distinguish the stimulus intensity by the number of neurons that are firing and the speed at which the neurons are firing. So the intensity um, is determined by the frequency of nerve impulse transduction by the receptor. The greater the stimulus intensity, the greater the frequency of receptor nerve impulses. So let's take sound as a modality. If it's a loud sound, that means that's a greater stimulus intensity. That means those receptors will be firing faster in your ear in response to a loud sound, in response to a quiet sound. For a touch, that's a different modality. If it's very, very hot, it's going to respond, um, your thermoreceptors are going to fire faster than if it's just warm. So again, some of these are kind of obvious, but receptors transmit all these kinds of information, right? Modality, which means the type of stimulus, location, meaning where is it in the body, intensity, like how strong is the stimulus, 
and duration. How long does the stimulus last? All four of these um, types of information are taken into account by sensory receptors. So like I mentioned before, an adaptation is a decline in the rate of nerve impulse formation due to repeated stimulation by the same stimulus. So when you first enter a room, you might smell a strong perfume. But if you wait a few minutes or even, you know, 30 seconds, sometimes your brain adapts and you decline the same rate of impulses is um, from the nose to the brain changes. It's decreasing over time because you get used to it. And this is good, right? Evolutionarily speaking, it's okay. We're aware of a smell, but how much do I want that to affect me? I have better things to do than just focus on this one annoying smell. So my brain habituates and adapts and it says, okay, I'm going to ignore that for now. I'm going to move on to more important things. So a lot of the times we think about this, if you're living in a city and you hear a lot of taxi cabs, usually then you kind of drown out the noise of all the honking after a while you habituate. Right. And this is preventing the nervous system from being overloaded by unimportant stimuli. An exception to this is with pain. So we do not become uh, habituated to pain with pain receptors. Um, so that's a common misconception that you can adapt to pain. Some people have different thresholds for pain, um, but once you don't become habituated uh, to pain. Once adaptation occurs, you need a stronger stimulus to gain a response. So if you become habituated to a certain smell of perfume, you would need to spray more of that perfume in order for another ash potential to be generated by your olfactory epithelium. So now let's talk about different types of receptors. Receptors for the general senses are very simple. So the general senses include like touch and um, pain and vibration, stretch, all that stuff. So these consist of one or a few sensor <clears throat> sensory nerve fibers, possibly with some connective tissue. So you can have a very simple receptor, which is as simple as just a sensory neuron with three nerve endings. And that can respond to the stimulus directly. Or you can have an enclosed or what's called an encapsulated um, nerve ending, which is a nerve fiber wrapped in glial cells. In this case, right, if it's the central nervous system, it would be oligodendrocytes. If it's the peripheral nervous system, they're Schwann cells. And this is connective tissue that's wrapped around the nerve ending. And what this usually does is it enhances the sensitivity of the nerve fiber, or it makes it more selective with respect to which modality it can respond to. So these encapsulated nerve endings are usually more complex um, and more sensitive. So regardless, we have the cell body that's out of the way right? In unipolar sensory neurons. So we have the nerve ending can be either free or encapsulated in connected tissue. Um, the actual axon can be unmyelinated or myelinated. The cell body is always out of the way in a unipolar neuron. So we'll talk about different types of general sense receptors first by the type of stimulus they detect. So a thermoreceptor detects temperature, right? They respond to heat and cold. We have thermoreceptors that respond to cold and thermoreceptors that respond to heat. We have free nerve endings in the deep dermis that detect um, temperature. And if it's above 45 degrees Celsius, then we feel burn. If it's below 10 degrees Celsius, we feel like um, frostbite. So that's the pain receptors in response to uh, thermoreceptors. So there's a connection between thermoreceptors and nociceptors, which are pain receptors. And those can respond to changes in heat, like I just mentioned, 
but also to tissue damage and to certain chemicals that are toxic to the body. And we have free nerve endings everywhere in the body except for the brain. So that's why you can cut into the brain and not feel it. Right, so we said tissue damage um, and extreme hot and cold can detect, uh, can be, or can stimulate nociceptors and causing the brain to detect pain. Uh, next, we have proprioceptors, which detect body position. And these receptors sense the position and the movement of the body in real time. So as you adjust your position, your proprioceptors are aware of that. So we have those spindle cells. If you remember, um, we have receptors in our skeletal muscle and our tendons that know when the muscles contract, when they're relaxed, and in what position they're in. And these constantly inform our brain of where we are in space. Right, so the proprioceptors inform the brain about the positioning of the body um, and whether it's moving or whether it's stationary. Chemoreceptors are receptors that detect chemicals. So these are specialized neurons that monitor body fluids for chemical changes like pH. So we have special receptors in our uh, brain that detect any pH imbalances. Also, ion concentration. Do we have enough sodium? And do we have enough glucose in our blood? So these are all chemoreceptors that respond to chemicals. This also includes um, odors, right? Those are also chemicals. And these nerve impulses from the chemoreceptors are not processed by the cerebral cortex right away. Right? We're never aware of pH until the doctor tells us that we have a pH problem with our blood, right? We're not aware of a lot of the chemoreceptors. So the nerve impulses from chemoreceptors in our body are not processed by the cerebral cortex. We're not, since we're not consciously aware of blood glucose changes or sodium concentration changes. But some chemoreceptors in our nose, for example, and our tongue uh, can be processed by the cerebral cortex if it's in terms of taste. But with the general, remember we're talking about general senses. So general chemoreceptors are not consciously, um, are not consciously perceived. Photoreceptors detect light. So light is made up of photons and photons can stimulate action potentials. So these are different kinds of receptors. Mechanoreceptors are a large category of receptors that respond to any physical deformation of the cells or tissue. So if you touch something, if you displace tissue, right, if you deform any type of tissue, you're going to be stimulating mechanoreceptors. So these receptors, there's so many kinds of different mechanoreceptors that can detect pressure, there are others that detect vibration, some that detect stretch, some that detect very light touch versus very um, pointy, like pain, and very sharp touch. So mechanoreceptors are the general class of receptors that respond to any phys physical deformation of the cells or tissues that are caused by vibration touch, pressure, stretch, or tension. So here's an example of this sensory neuron that's in the epithelium. This is a touch receptor or a tactile receptor. So if this were in my fingertips, if I press on the epidermis, that's deforming the cells, right? When you're pressing on, you're applying pressure to these epithelial cells, that's applying some kind of disturbance, and that will activate the dendrites of this tactile cell, which will send the information um, down this axon to the peripheral nerves, the right spinal nerve, and then our brain will perceive that as a touch. We just felt something. We just felt some kind of a pressure. And of course, our brain 
tells us where this stimulus was detected because of projection. So once the cerebral cortex receives the information of the stimulus, the cerebral cortex projects the sensation back to the body region where that nerve impulse originated. So for example, when we press down our finger, press our finger down on the table, that message is getting sent to our brain, but where in the brain is it going? Right? We, we spoke about the somatosensory cortex. Um, so the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe is going to receive a signal from our finger, right, in the specific location where our brain knows it's the finger. So we have a specific region of our parietal lobe that's responsible for our left finger, for example. So when we press our left finger down, that message is being sent to the specific location in our postcentral gyrus of our parietal lobe that's responsible for our left finger. And then when that part of the brain gets activated, it gets projected back to our left finger. So we feel it in our left finger. It's a little complicated, um, but this is this idea of projection, right? Is the somatosensory cortex allows us to perceive where the sensation originates and the cerebral cortex will project that sensation back to where it originated. So the pathways followed by sensory signals to the central nervous system, those are all called projection pathways. And most amount of sensory signals go by three neurons. There's like a three neuron route to the brain. There's a first order neuron, a second order neuron, and a third order neuron. I'm not going to go into too much details about this, um, but it's, it becomes important um, when we talk about um, the touch pathway. And this is one thing I want you to understand. I want you to know the basic pathway. How does our brain perceive touch? What's the pathway from a nociceptor to the uh, somatosensory cortex? So the best way to understand that um, is I really like this link over here. So I would highly recommend, well, you can't see that here. So I'm going to try to um, pause this one second. I'm going to pull up this link. And this is a really good link that talks about the pathway involved for um, the perception of touch, how you feel, how you, I, um, how you know that you're touching something. And that's illustrated in this diagram from the book um, in terms of a nociceptor touching attack. So I'm going to pause here. So here I am at the Get Body Smart website, and I just want to illustrate the three steps to the touch pathway. So this is showing how a receptor in the skin is going to signal to the brain that it's been touched, it's been contacted. And how does the brain project that back, that we are actually aware that our skin has been contacted? So the first step is we have a sensory neuron. This is our first order neuron. Um, so the sensory receptor is the first order neuron that's in the skin. And in response to contact, so if I'm pressing down on the skin, that sensory receptor will be activated. And what we know about sensory receptors is that their cell body is far away. It's in the central nervous system, specifically in the posterior, the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord. And that signal is going to be sent by this first order neuron through the dorsal column of the spinal cord. So depending where in the body the skin receptor is located, it's going to activate a specific spinal nerve. That spinal nerve will then go into the spinal cord. And in the dorsal column, that nerve will go up to the medulla. And in the medulla, specifically in the medial meniscus, you don't have to know that term, but there is an interneuron in the brainstem that will then transmit this message to the thalamus. This is called our second order neuron. So the neuron that goes from the brainstem I want to see the whole thing. So that's the first step. 
right, of the second step. So this is all of our first order neuron. So again, sensory receptor, ganglion, spinal cord, all the way up to the brainstem. Now we're ready for the second order neuron to take that from the brainstem to the thalamus. This is our second order neuron. Remember the thalamus is then the relay station. It's gonna interpret all these signals being sent and then the thalamus says, okay, that's a touch signal. I'm, that's a touch signal from the lower part of the body. I'm gonna send that to the somatosensory cortex in the part of the body that um, corresponds to this sensory receptor. So every part of the body has a specific location on the somatosensory cortex that it's connected to. So finally, we need our third order neuron to go from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex so we can perceive the contact. So that's the three-step process. So first order neuron goes from sensory receptor all the way to the brainstem. The second order neuron goes from brainstem to thalamus. The third order neuron goes from thalamus to cerebral cortex. So I'd like you to know that general three-step pathway. And here you can see that. So I'm not going to talk too much about the pain pathway here, actually, um, because there are two separate tracts. But again, the basic idea is there is a first order nerve fiber um, that could conduct a pain signal that goes to the spinal cord. Then from the spinal cord, you have a second order nerve fiber that goes from the spinal cord to the thalamus. And then you have a third order nerve fiber that goes from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex, to the cerebral cortex. So that's a three-step process for pain detection. Your nociceptor feeds into the spinal cord, spinal cord to thalamus, thalamus, cerebral cortex. That's the pain pathway. So now we're going to move on to special senses um, that are all perceived by sense organs. So special senses are perceived by sense organs, meaning the eye, ear, nose, and tongue. So we do have some general sense receptors that are required for our special senses. So we said photoreceptors detect light, but we have photoreceptors in our retina, right in the back of our eye, that detect light for vision. But the eye is a sense organ because there's all these different kinds of tissues. You have blood and you have fat and you have connective tissues and you have um, nerve neurons. You have all these different kinds of cells in an eye, not just the photoreceptors. So it's a sense organ. Um, and we call that then vision is therefore a special sense because it's perceived by a sense organ. Chemoreceptors in the nose and tongue um, are responsible for smell and taste. So chemoreceptors detect chemicals in the nose for smell or chemicals on the tongue for taste. Um, and again, since our tongue and nose have many different types of cells, not just sensory receptors, we call those sense organs. And therefore we have um, taste and smell considered special senses. Believe it or not, my counterreceptors in the ear are critical for hearing and equilibrium. So mechanoreceptors are activated by any type of displacement. So even sound is an, is actually called an acoustic disturbance. So any change in the air frequency, any change will hit your eardrum and will activate certain receptors that respond to the change in air frequency. Also, we have mechanoreceptors in our ear that are responsible for equilibrium. So like knowing when we're properly balanced. So when we bend over, certain hair cells change position and that causes displacement of certain sensory cells that tell our brain that we're changing our position. We're moving our head to the side. So that's caused by physical displacement of cells. And that's, um, again, what mechanoreceptors do. They respond to physical displacement 
and uh, transmit transduce that displacement into nerve signals. So now we will talk about the first special sense, smell. And a good way to start this is just by watching this crash course. Um, the crash course covers taste and smell. Just a fun fact is we possess over 350 types of different olfactory receptors. So we have 350 different types of receptors that each can pick up one type of smell, one type of odorant. And we have thousands of different receptor genes, but many are called pseudogenes because they're not functional. So we have thousands of different olfactory receptor genes, but many of them can't really pick up any smell that we're, no, that we're aware of. They're kind of just fake. Um, but we have 350 types that actually can pick up smell. And each of these receptors can only pick up one type of odorant. The average person can distinguish between two and 4,000 different odors. Some people can detect up to 10,000. And it's very hard to kind of group uh, different odors because it depends how the brain processes them. So when we detect a smell, it's a combination of many different odorants. Um, recent research has indicated that women can detect a wider range of odors than men. And we now know that odor reception or odor detection decreases with increased age um, because of the hair cells um, get sensitized where they get they get um, accustomed and tired basically of picking up all these senses that there's um, a loss of olfactory receptors and they become desensitized so as we age we become less sensitive to taste and smell and another fun fact is that olfactory receptors are the only neurons that are exposed to the outside so your nostrils Right, in your epithelium, specifically in the, I should say, the mucosa, we have receptors, olfactory receptors in the mucosa of the nasal cavity that feed directly to the brain. So it's the only part of the nervous system that's directly exposed um, to the outside environment. Our olfactory receptors live for only about 60 days, so they're pretty short-lived, um, and they constantly get re, um, re-synthesized. So now let's talk about some of the anatomy in smell. And let's start um, in the nose. So the mucosa, the olfactory mucosa, is the superior portion of the nasal cavity. And you can remind yourself, what is mucosa? What does it actually mean to be, what is a mucous membrane? All right, and we know that it's pseudostratified, ciliated columnar epithelium overlaying loose connected tissue um, and this is exactly what this olfactory mucosa is right so that's this question so the mucosa is composed of olfactory receptors so this is the mucosa and here you have the receptors that are called olfactory receptors and they themselves have special cilia they have cilia and they're surrounded by supporting epithelial cells, right? And these are columnar cells. And of course we have a mucus layer that helps trap any pathogens, but it's also responsible for making the odorants soluble. So it's important to uh, make all the odorants soluble through the mucus so they can be detected by these cilia. Same idea as saliva in the tongue. You need saliva to help make the taste molecules soluble um, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to detect that. So we have the olfactory mucosa. Um, only part of the mucosa has these um, receptors though. So not the, the entire mucosa does not have olfactory receptors. Um, the olfactory receptors um, are only in some part of the nose. And again, we have these special receptors that have the cilia 
that are exposed to the particles in the nasal passage. So the olfactory receptors are also called olfactory sensory neurons because they're feeding directly to the central nervous system. This is the brain. This is the cranial nerve that feeds into the brain. So this is the direct route, this sensory neuron. Um, another thing to think about is what kinds of cells are these neurons? Are these unipolar, bipolar, or multipolar? So that's going to come up in a bit. So you should think about that. This is, the, this is an interesting type of cell over here. So we have the, this is the mucosa. The mucosa, we said, has um, pseudostratified columnar epithelium that makes mucus. The mucus can trap any pathogens. And we have these cilia on the olfactory receptors that can be exposed to any odorants, any smell molecules in the nasal passage. So now let's talk about how the anatomy ties into the physiology and the actual sense of smell. So we said that chemicals that are dissolved in the air, so they're all odorants that are in, in the air already, they have to dissolve in the mucus layer first in order to stimulate these olfactory um, receptors. So they dissolve in the mucus um, and the odor molecules each have to find a specific receptor on an olfactory hair, on these little cilia. So each receptor is only responsible for binding to one specific smell molecule. Once that smell molecule finds its receptor on the olfactory hair, then it could send a message down the olfactory receptor. And there are two types of odorant molecules that it could be either hydrophilic, which can go directly through the mucus and interact with the cilia, these, um, these olfactory cilia, or the hydrophobic ones that can't interact with the watery mucus have to bind to special proteins that help transport the odor molecule through the mucus so they can interact with the cilia of the olfactory receptors. So regardless of whether it's, so we have odorant binding proteins that bind hydrophobic odorants, hydrophilic odorants can diffuse freely through the mucus of the epithelium and bind directly to a receptor. So that's step one, right? The odor molecule binds to a membrane receptor on the olfactory hair. In response to an odorant binding to a receptor, on the inside of the cell, a G protein is activated and the cyclic AMP second messenger system is activated inside the olfactory cell. This will lead to depolarization of this olfactory receptor and that will depolarize the membrane and trigger an action potential in the olfactory nerves that travel to the brain. So this, let's say, let's take this cell over here. Here's an odor molecule. This one was hydrophilic, so it diffused the mucus, and it just happened to interact with this receptor over here. This was one receptor that picks up the smell of vanilla. So this is a vanilla molecule. This is a vanilla odor um, olfactory receptor. So vanilla is a hydrophilic molecule. It diffuses through the mucus, interacts with this olfactory receptor. And in response to binding to that vanilla odorant receptor, it allows sodium inside because a G protein was activated and cyclic AMP built up and it opened sodium channels that allows sodium inside this receptor that depolarizes it. And this could then cause an action potential in these sensory neurons of the olfactory bulb. So that's how we get a signal from the outside to the inside. So the cyclic AMP system is gonna open up ion channels first. 
and that's going to cause depolarization. And those signals will then be sent to the brain. So when the olfactory fibers pass through, they have to pass through the roof of the nose, they enter a pair of olfactory bulbs. So this is called the olfactory bulb. And here is where they synapse with dendrites of other kinds of cells that feed in directly to the olfactory, um, to the part of the brain that processes smell. So we have the cilia in the upper portion of the nasal passage, and then they have to go through the cribriform plate. We have to go through this bony, the bony portion, through these little um, foramina, and that's where they interact with the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb leads from the through the olfactory tract to the olfactory cortex. So the primary olfactory cortex is in the temporal lobe. And that's the final or the almost final destination. So remember, um, the temporal lobe has the primary olfactory cortex. Um, these signals do not go through the thalamus first. Right? This is one of the examples. The olfactory signals can reach the cerebral cortex directly without going to the thalamus first. This is not true of any other sense but olfaction but our sense of smell. So the olfactory receptors all form cranial nerve one. So the cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve, which carry them to the olfactory bulb. The nerve impulses are passed to neurons of the olfactory tract which then go to the olfactory centers of the cerebrum, specifically in the temporal lobe, where the scent is perceived. So this is an overview of the projection pathways of the brain. So after we go from the olfactory, from the olfactory bulb, this is the olfactory bulb, from the olfactory bulb, you go through the olfactory tracts to the primary olfactory cortex of the temporal lobe. From there, signals travel to several secondary destinations into the cerebrum and the brainstem. Two of these important destinations are in the insula which is that hidden lobe of the cerebral cortex, and also to the orbitofrontal cortex. And the orbitofrontal cortex is where we identify what the odor is, and it also helps receive input from our tongue, from taste. So the orbitofrontal cortex can combine taste and smell to give us an overall perception of flavor. In addition to the orbitofrontal cortex and the insula, the primary olfactory cortex also sends messages to the limbic system, like the amygdala and hypothalamus, right? And this is where some of the scents we are exposed to evoke emotional responses. So certain smells might be very pleasing or might be very um, unpleasant. It can also make you salivate, make you want more of something, right? So these involve emotions and memory. So that's where the um, hypo that's where the amygdala comes in, where we have emotional regulation associated with smells. Right, and like I mentioned, olfactory signals reach the cortex directly without passing through the thalamus. This is an exception to the rule.
So it all started in the olfactory mucosa in the nasal passage. These olfactory nerves, cranial nerves one, um, receive signals from the sensory neurons of the olfactory receptors, and these feed into the olfactory bulb, which send the message toward the olfactory tract. Those go um, on the underside of the frontal lobes, where they go to the primary olfactory cortex. And from there, we know that there are um, secondary destinations like the insula and the orbital frontal cortex. So that was an overview of smell. And the key point to remember is that food is made up of many different odorants. Our a smell of perfume is made up of many different odorants. So it's many different receptors are being activated at once. And it's the combination of different receptors activated that give a message to the brain of what you're smelling or what that particular scent is. So now we'll talk about taste. So this is a good time to pause before we um, go on. So now we'll talk about gustation. And the types of receptors responsible for uh, gustatory responses are chemoreceptors. And we have chemoreceptors located on our taste buds in the tongue. And when you look at your tongue, you might notice these bumps. Those are not taste buds. Those are called lingual papillae. Lingual papillae. And we have um, many different kinds of lingual papillae. We have four different kinds of lingual papillae. Um, one without taste buds, three with taste buds. And only one type of uh, lingual papilla really has a lot of our taste buds on them. So we have about 4,000 taste buds on our tongue that are located in lingual papillae. This is an actual taste bud over here. This is one taste bud, this little circle. If we were to zoom in, let's look at the tongue over here. This is a lingual papilla, this whole little bump. And if we were to zoom in, you can see these little circles, each of those are taste buds. So each lingual papilla, each bump on your tongue has many of these taste buds. Each taste bud can have up to 250 different, um, sorry, each taste each lingual papilla, each lingual papilla can have up to um, 250 different taste buds in it. Each taste bud, if you were to zoom in, each taste bud is a group of cells. It could be 50 to 150 different cells that are grouped together in a bud arrangement. And these types of cells include chemoreceptors and other supporting epithelial cells. So a taste bud is multiple kinds of cells that are grouped together in a bud. There's a taste pore on the epithelial surface of the tongue. This is a taste pore, and that's a, a small pit um, where certain tastants, that's a chemical stimulus, so a tastant can go through the taste pore and interact with a gustatory hair that extend from the chemoreceptor through the taste pore. So we have these gustatory hairs, um, very similar to the olfactory cells, like I have those little, um, those little cilia. In this case, these are microvilli called taste hairs, and those are the receptor surfaces for tastants. So we said the, the taste hairs go through the taste pores, um, and each of these taste pores leads to a taste receptor. From the taste receptor, we have sensory neurons that are attached on the opposite side. So we have a gustatory hair on one side, then we have the taste receptor, and then we have the sensory neuron axon on the other side. So let's zoom in one more time. Here we have 
the taste pore. We have these little gustatory hairs coming through the taste pore. And in blue, we have these supporting epithelial cells. And in purple, we have taste receptors. And together, those make up a taste bud. And when a tastant interacts with a gustatory hair through the taste pore, these neurons will send nervous signals to the brain saying, okay, you just tasted something. Let's take a step back. And in order to activate a taste cell, a chemical must be dissolved in a liquid first. So that's where saliva comes in. And we have five confirmed basic tastes. Each has an evolutionary function. And I will note that there is an old concept of a taste map, and that's proven to not be correct. So we do detect five different um, taste sensations primarily. Um, but all of these are detected throughout the tongue. Right? Receptors for each taste are scattered across the tongue. And we have different receptors for each of these different types of taste. So salty. So our salty receptors detect metal ions like sodium. So salt is sodium chloride. So when we have sodium chloride on our tongue, certain receptors will detect that sodium and send a signal to the brain that, okay, I just had sodium. This is salt. And this is very important for our physiology because we need to have the right electrolyte balance and the right blood pressure, right? So blood pressure is tied to the right type of uh, the right balance of sodium in our blood. So we need to crave salt. Animals do crave salt and look out for salt um, so we can have the right type of electrolyte balance. Sweet receptors are, are activated by um, different sugar tastants, so, uh, sugary tastants. Um, there are different types of receptors that can detect sweet molecules. They belong to a group of receptors called um, HT23 receptors. They're a type of G protein coupled receptors. And you should think to yourself, why do you think we need sweet receptors? What's the bit, what's the benefit? Why do you think our ancestors would have benefited from having special receptors that detect sweet molecules? So sweet is associated with foods of high caloric value. So this means that way back in the savannah, if you had somebody who can crave and detect sweet molecules, that means they'd be able to pick up the ripest fruits and get the most sugar, the most energy from foods. So this is um, called gorging theory too. Um, that there's an idea that we had a craving for sweet foods so we can maximize our intake of calories and get the most amount of energy especially when we didn't know where our next meal would come from. So we detect sweet foods and we learn that it's a positive thing so we can get as many calories in and get as much um, energy as possible. However, today we're not on the savannah and this becomes a little counterproductive because we still crave sweet things even when we have a lot of energy. So we're tempted to go get chocolate ice cream from the freezer because we're craving sweet things um, but we're not in the savannah, so we're not desperate for energy. So our brain hasn't uh, caught on yet. We're still tricked into wanting sweet things. Umami is the um, meaty taste that's associated with um, sometimes like soy sauce or meats or tomato has a lot of umami. So that's the, it's really produced by amino acids. And that's like a mushroomy, some kind of like Parmesan cheese has a lot of umami. Um, and this is thought to motivate protein intake, since this is the taste of certain amino acids. So it's inspiring us to eat more protein. We have sour receptors that detect acids, such as in citrus fruit. Um, and these can help us know if something is spoiled or not. Something tastes sour when it's spoiled. And similarly, bitter receptors help us know if something is a poison or something is spoiled. 
So some plants use bitter compounds in their uh, in their flour to deter animals and humans like humans from eating their fruits. So when we perceive flavor, it's due to the activation of several different taste receptor types. So when we eat ice cream, it's not really only the, the sweet receptors. We're also tasting some of the sourness from the fruit, some of the saltiness maybe. Um, if it's a chocolate ice cream especially, you have many, you have sweet, you have salty, you have bitter. Um, you might have some umami, even some meatiness is associated with some like a dark chocolate, some sourness. So flavor is quite complex. And as we know, the olfactory system is also heavily tied with flavor. So flavor is a combined perception of olfaction and gustation. Also the food texture and the temperature of the food and the appearance of the food plays a role. And we have certain taste receptors on certain um, lingual papillae that are responsible for just detecting mouthfeel and texture of food and not even the taste. So our tongue is responsible for taste, um, for not only taste, but for texture. And just like in olfactory cells, these chemical molecules are sending action potentials. So we have to think about it. How do we transduce chemical energy or chemicals into an action potential? You can either depolarize the cell directly. So certain um, acids, and metal ions like sodium can actually go directly into cells, depolarize them, and cause action potentials that go sent, that go to the brain. So like H plus is in acids, right? So like citrus fruits. So when you eat a citrus, those protons, those acidic molecules can directly depolarize cells and tell the brain that you're eating something sour. Other um, molecules like sweet molecules bind to their certain receptor, which causes a second messenger system inside the cell to activate um, a neuron. So sugars and some bitter compounds bind to receptors that activate G proteins and cyclic AMP, which can then depolarize the cell and send a message to the brain via sending neurotransmitters. So what happens is at the base of taste cells, neurotransmitters are released, as I'll show you here. So these taste cells release neurotransmitters that get sent to the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the taste buds send their information to the two cranial nerves. Those all go to the medulla and the brainstem. So step one, taste buds are activated, so they get depolarized. We said either directly or by second messengers. That causes the release of neurotransmitters that will allow either the propagation or the termination of nerve signals through the cranial nerves. Um, specifically, we have cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve, and cranial nerve nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Those are both directly hooking up the taste buds to the brainstem. So all fibers reach um, the medulla from the, from the cranial nerves. Um, specifically, it's called the solitary nucleus. So all the taste fibers project the medulla in the solitary nucleus. And this is where second order neurons project to the thalamus. And in the thalamus, so this is the second order neuron going from the solitary nucleus in the medulla to the thalamus. And from the thalamus, it's going to relay the signal to the gustatory cortex of the insula. And that's where we can go um, and that's where we perceive taste is in the insula. And that's where we, and then from there, those process signals get sent to the orbitofrontal cortex, 
where they get perceived, they get integrated with the um, olfactory signals and also our visual signals where we understand what we're tasting. So again, this is a three-step pathway. We start from taste buds. We have taste receptors in our taste buds that each respond to different tastants. When a tastant finds its taste receptor in a taste bud, it gets depolarized. That depolarization leads to neurotransmitters being sent to these cranial nerves that first get sent to the medulla. From the medulla, they go to the thalamus, from the thalamus to the gustatory cortex and the insula, and from there to the orbitofrontal cortex. So here's a quick video to watch that will review some of the concepts of the physiology of taste. The detection of specific water-soluble molecules found in food or drink results in the sensation of taste. Specialized cells found in taste buds on the tongue contain receptors capable of interacting with molecules found in our food. When a taste receptor is stimulated, an electrical signal is produced by the sensory cell, resulting in an impulse which is transmitted to the brain and results in the perception of taste. And there are many disorders of taste. Um, and you can have complete loss of all taste function in agusia. You can also have reduced ability to taste in hypogusia. And you can have dysgusia, which is distortion of taste. And these hypogusia and dysgusia can be caused by zinc deficiencies or chemotherapy. Um, but also um, dysgusia happens um, temporarily in some pregnant women um, or in response to certain medications where you taste something that's not really there. Similarly, we have several disorders for smell. Um, and the human sense of smell is a lot better than our ability to taste. Um, in fact, our ability to taste relies on our ability to smell. Okay. We can have complete inability to detect odors. That's anosmia. And that can be a nervous system uh, blockage, like a nasal, that can be like um, the cranial nerve one is damaged or the temporal lobe is damaged, like part of the nervous system itself, or you could have something inflamed in the nasal mucosa, perhaps by um, infection or inflammation. You could also have hyposmia, which is a decrease in the ability to detect odors. And we see that a lot in individuals who smoke for a long time, right? They become less sensitive to certain smells. And finally, we could have dysosmia, which is a distorted sense um, of smell. And it can have either an altered smell perception um, that's called parosmia. So for example, um, every time you smell roses, you want to throw up or something because of an association that you have. So it's your brain is distorting um, the stimulus. Or you could even have phantosmia, which is a perception of an odor that is not even present. Um, sometimes people who suffer from migraines or other uh, mental disorders can actually perceive a scent that's not there. So these are some disorders of taste and smell. And that is the end of part one. Uh, and then in the next and final section, we'll discuss the eye and vision.